Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator. I'm your host. I'm your cat herder. And I'm your guide to the next hour of conversation. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a fantastic guest on a very important subject. We're talking about a subject that has vexed people for quite some time. And by quite some time, I don't mean last year. I mean, the first ebook arguably dates back to 1979. And people have been reading on screens as long as we've had screens. And so we've always had the question, is digital reading better or worse? Is it different in a way that we find powerful or in a way that we find harms the intellect? Is it an evil force or is it something good and beneficial or something in between or something more complicated? There are oceans of ink, both physical and digital, spilled on this, all kinds of research. And it's an important topic when we're thinking about higher education, especially in our time right now when so much is invested online. Now, Dr. Janae Cohn has published a wonderful, powerful new book, which I recommend absolutely to everybody. If you haven't read this, it's really, really, really good because not only does it give you a deep dive into how, forgive the pun based on the title, on how to teach practically, but it also grounds this by looking at the research into reading, everything from literary criticism to neurology, and it looks back at the history and practice of reading and what it means to have a book or to read. And all of this in an incredibly accessible format with a great bunch of wit and the funniest, most sarcastic opening painting I've ever seen in a scholarly book. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Janae Cohn. And let me just bring her up on stage so you can say. Welcome, Dr. Cohn. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for having me. And thanks for that introduction. Um, I'm a fan of all puns and extended metaphors. That's the okay. title is just one big metaphor. <laughs> so any metaphors are welcome, I guess, is what I'm really saying here. Oh, good. Thanks, well, all for being, being, thanks to everyone for being here. I appreciate it. Well, I, I have to say, I, I went last month, I had my first scuba diving uh, lesson. So I appreciate your title even more. Uh, oh, wonderful. You know, we have um, all kinds of things to talk about and, and all kinds of ways to introduce you. But the way I'd like to introduce you is to ask you what you're going to be working on for the next year. Uh, what kind of projects are you going to be doing? What kind of ideas are going to be top of mind as you wrestle with the next academic year? Gosh, there's a huge buffet of things I'm thinking about for the next year. Um, I'll name a few of them. Um, one real top of mind project right now um, that I'm working on um, is really kind of think in an even sort of broader capacity about how we design for learning. Um, something that this book got me really interested in thinking about are the ways in which we leverage media, materiality, um, and the affordances and limitations of interface design to construct different kinds of learning experiences. Reading is one kind of learning experience that I've been deeply interested in for quite some time. And I think there's still more we could do to kind of expand the line of inquiry from this book to be thinking even more broadly about how we really have very aligned conversations um, that bring together students' lived experiences with materiality, interface design, and learning processes and purposes. Um, to have a really holistic conversation about effective um, learning in digital spaces. So that's one mm. project I've been thinking about. Um, and I've been working with my colleague, Michael Greer, who's here today on, on some of that thinking. So it's nice to see a, a colleague in the crowd here. Um, the other big project I'm still thinking about is um, something I'm calling, you know, online learning with low tech tools. Um, I feel like the past year. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about video conferencing. We're using a really kind of high bandwidth video conferencing tool here, which is wonderful. But there's so much really low tech, low bandwidth online learning we could be doing and leveraging even more um, that we still haven't taken full advantage of. And text is a perfect example of that. So I'm still really interested in thinking about ways that we talk about text and reading based experiences. Um, in ways that are still sort of functioning in, in the high tech environment, so to speak. Those are the two projects that are really top of mind for next year. And of course, I know all of us are grappling with the big, I mean, future facing question, what you specialize in Brian, about what the future of higher education is gonna look like, what role uh, online digital learning is really going to play in the future of higher education. And so of course I'm invested in thinking through those conversations, how we articulate really the next phases of um, online learning for campuses nationwide. And well, internationally, really. I know we have an international crowd here. 
indeed, indeed. And and our audience broadly over time is international as well. What kind of uh, I mean, how does this play out in your in your day to day work at Cal State? Uh, I mean, you support faculty, you teach classes, you do research. How you know, are, or should we look forward to some crazed workshops from you and some really exciting new articles? How does it play out? Well, it's right now it's been playing out largely at the level of um, supporting faculty, really. Mm -hmm. um, I mm -hmm. think that after the past 17 months of emergency remote instruction, um, a big part of the work I've been doing on a day-to-day -day basis is really helping faculty think about that last kind of project I'm considering, that next phase. So how do we take the lessons that we've learned um, throughout the 17 months or prior and really make those continue to feel accessible and um, operational in many ways um, in whatever sort of, I don't even want to call it a post-pandemic future because that suggests a linear end and I'm not sure that's going to be how our future is going to play out. Mm -hmm. um, but perhaps in, in I'll just call this a kind of a post-trauma moment yeah. for the world. Yeah. How do we um, move forward with using educational technology with grace, with equity, um, yeah. with access issues at the forefront? Mm -hmm. So there's always a writing project in me somewhere <laughs> that'll that'll come out of this. Um, you know, my job is is largely there's you know it's administrative job that I drive through research and teaching. So you know, on a day to day basis, I'm really thinking about the operations and and how we keep things people feel supported and moving at the core. Um, but the way that I think through and come up with new ideas is through writing. So um, we'll just kind of have to see what things emerge from our, our grounded lived experiences here. And I'd be eager to hear from others what kinds of things they're doing at their campuses too to help leverage some of this transitional inflection point moment that we're all in. Well, I'm sure people here won't be shy and have all kinds of Good. things to say. Uh, if you um, and and friends, I'm going to ask about one or two more questions, and then I'm going to get out of the way and let you take over. Remember that this is a forum that you get to make. The forum is kind of like soil and green; it's made out of people. Um, so please uh, feel free to share your questions and your thoughts. Um, one question I, I'd like to ask: in in your book, you offer these five C's, uh, which is a, a, a nice a nice way of thinking about this: a guide for teachers to think about how to structure a digital reading. And uh, one of them is curation uh, and helping students make, you know, curate their reading not, and, and selection, assembling and, and connecting them, which I, I think is very, very powerful. And you begin with the great anecdote of making mixtapes and, uh, and CDs, which I, I really appreciate. Um, I'm curious, what are some of the great uh, practices you want to encourage instructors to do in helping students curate their reading now? I mean, students often have pre-existing tools that might not work so well for that. They'll be in an LMS, which doesn't really do that. They'll have various forms of social media, some of which can do it, but usually they don't see them for, for class. I mean, what, what kind of digital uh, practice are you suggesting? So I think there's a range of practices that can support curatorial thinking, some of which are very low tech and some of it which might have some more uh, bells and whistles, so to speak. Um, so one you know curatorial practice I'd really encourage um, instructors to help their students with doing um, is is frankly you know note taking. It's a curatorial practice, mm. and it's one of these mm. academic skills that I feel like a lot of faculty, you know, myself included, have lamented in the past. Oh, that you know, it's it's challenging for students to learn how to take notes, and that's because um, the process of learning to take notes is really a process of being able to um, have some heuristics and frameworks to discern what matters. To think about okay. What am I looking for? What's the purpose of what I'm trying to read or do? And what am I trying to accomplish? You can't curate anything very successfully until you kind of know or have some sense of what you're trying to curate for. Um, so if we're talking tools, there are, again, some very low tech tools you can do to kind of create effective note taking practice. That might mean creating in a collaborative document building tool, a Google Doc or online Office 365 doc, little um, tables or graphic organizers to help students with note taking. You could sure. do the old yeah. Um, yeah. Cornell note taking approach, but bring that into an online space so that you're sort of bridging that ability to process that the tremendous amount of information you find when you're doing research or reading online and build them into heuristics that allow you to, in again, something like a Google Docs or a Microsoft Word doc, see what other people are bringing into that space as well. So you could do some collaborative note taking or you could keep it individual task, but help students see how they can add in things like simple stuff, web 2.0 stuff, like links, right? Literal links to things that they're reading and commenting on. So they have that kind of 
organized curatorial space, and that can sync up with a learning management system pretty easily. You could go higher tech, of course. There are um, mm -hmm. lots of examples of, I think, collaborative annotation tools um, that engage, that can activate curation in some really powerful ways. Um, so I know social annotation tools are probably something someone's going to ask about at some point um, during this forum. So I'll seed that now by saying social annotation tools are a fabulous way to help students practice uh, curatorial thinking because they allow students to comment, to highlight, um, to see what other people have commented upon and highlighted. And that's a kind of curatorial thinking to crowdsource in that way, which makes, I think, the practice of bringing together lots of knowledge, identifying where other people are seeing key points really visible in ways that um, the learning management system certainly doesn't do. Um, and even again, social media is not, it's designed to kind of promote conversation, not necessarily to aggregate or see responses in aggregate. I think that's really a benefit to social annotations. You can kind of see these clustered um, sets of ideas together. Um, so those are just a few ideas. Um, I mean, we could talk about specific tools if people want kind of brand names for tools. Um, but I'm talking at a high level here so that we can kind of Which keep can. things open. And your appendix has a whole really, really good list of them. And and just friends, if you're new to the forum, we have some uh, some of our previous sessions have worked with these. Uh, we've had a couple of sessions on social annotation with people from Hypothesis, as well as the awesome Bob Stein uh, from New York. Uh, we've also had you know, more than a few sessions on learning management systems or virtual learning environments. So if you'd like to go back, we can find some more about that. Um, in the uh, in the chat, we've had a couple uh, some more praise for this. Uh, Tom Berkdahl, who teaches writing, uh, also on the West Coast, uh, said praises social annotation for teaching and learning. And Jerome uh, Petrozella mentions wikis are a great way of thinking about this as well. Uh, and before I can pursue this, before I can ask more questions, we've got a question here from our awesome friend Tom Haynes, uh, coming to us from the Houston area, and he has a typically deep question: How can we separate reading from information exchange, and therefore the medium? Digital allows us to chunk information differently than dead tree texts. Hmm. How do we separate reading from information exchange and therefore the medium? That's a great question, Tom. Thank you for asking that. I think my first shot is to invite anyone who's imagining a reading task to be thinking about the purpose of that reading task, right? So information exchange is of course one really core purpose of the reading task. But it may not be the sole purpose of the reading task at hand. Um, we tend to think of reading, you know, inf information exchange perhaps suggests that it's two way, right? That you're you're gleaning knowledge from someone, and perhaps by responding or annotating, you're you're participating in the exchange. But of course, there are also reading experiences where perhaps you're remixing that text, right? Maybe you're 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 taking um, and imagining how the author's words, literal words or ideas, can spin up into something creative of your own. Um, mm -hmm. That might mean thinking of text and perhaps, um, and I'm thinking of context like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, like in some literary or humanities-based context, perhaps you're using certain poems or novels, for example, as ways to look at and investigate language um, as a kind of object to be manipulated, an object to be thinking about um, in its own particular way. Um, so that might be another kind of purpose of reading um, that might change depending upon media as well. Um, so I think once we kind of interrogate what we're actually doing with reading, like literally what are we doing with that text? Yeah. Then we can start to think about, okay, well then how does media play a role in helping us advance that purpose or accomplish that purpose for reading in particular. Um, I think most of the time reading is exactly what you say, Tom, that it is at its core information exchange. Um, but it also might be a way to understand a certain positionality perspective, right? That reading is a window into subject, another subjectivity, right? It's a way for us to recognize a moment in time or a person's perspective. I think online, this is perhaps especially true, right? That um, our concerns with misinformation or disinformation largely come from a kind of like um, decontextualization of what we're seeing online. And so part of the reading task might also be recontextualizing um, disinformation that might get um, spread in ways that remove that context. Um, so I don't know, that's a long way of, of maybe answering your question, Tom, to say, Hey, as long as we start identifying that purpose, we can start aligning and seeing where media and materiality um, helps us do different things. 
when we're trying to accomplish that purpose? Well, I, I warned you it would be a deep question, and it was, and that was a splendid, splendid answer. <laughs> Thank you. All kinds of direction. Friends, if you're new to the forum, uh, that's an example of the Q&A box at work. You see how easy it was to uh, type and flash on the screen? So now is the time for you to share your questions and thoughts. Uh, we have a few more coming up, uh, one in the chat that I want to share, one that came in from someone who can't make it. Uh, the one from the chat comes from our friend in Ohio, Donnie Sendelbach who says there has been press that reading online is not as effective for retention and comprehension as reading printed text. I'm not convinced this is true. How do we help build the skill online beyond taking notes and annotation? Yeah, Donnie, thanks. That's a, a I, yeah, I've seen that press too. <laughs> and I'll have to say that like my kind of, um, frustration with that press was a lot of what fueled this book as well. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I started writing this book pre pandemic. Um, and so we, we've heard this narrative for a very you know long time. Um, so I will say a couple things because I, I too am not convinced it's true. And my working sort of argument on this, and this is an argument I make in the book as well, is that it's really challenging to assess the efficacy of reading on screen for comprehension-based outcomes if we have not taught or framed metacognitive strategies that are attentive to media and materiality. That is, if the strategies we've taught for reading, which is a social behavior, right, it's not something we are born with the ability to do, if we've been socialized to think in a certain, uh, within a certain media's constraints, that's how we're going to think about the task at hand. And um, I'll admit that's how I learned how to read in academic context, right? I learned to highlight and to dog ear and to use index cards to catalog my research ideas. These are successful strategies. They still work really, really well, but they're inherently tied to the media and materiality of print. So I think one way to answer your question, Donnie, that we build that skill beyond taking notes and annotation, which are really digitized versions of analog-based practices, is that we also start to think about skills that um, are beneficial to particular kinds of practices that are aligned with the screen. Let me give an example of this. Uh, for example, if you're teaching a research-based task, a reading skill you need to learn actually is the ability to skim a bunch of different texts mm -hmm. to figure out what you need. You cannot read and focus and annotate every single thing you read deeply for a research task. I'm sure many of you who are researchers here in this forum know that. You have to look through a lot of different things to find what's going to work for your project. So I think a skill we could be more attentive to in a digital space where it's really an affordance of the spaces, the ability to access lots of different voices all at once is the ability to use to, I'm going to use Mike Caulfield's language here, to mm -hmm. read laterally, mm -hmm. um, to, to employ tabs effectively, to be able to look for and use um, an understanding of the scholarly written genre or the online text-based genre to look for keywords or patterns ideas to allow you to synthesize quickly. That's a way to leverage the benefit of on-screen reading for certain kinds of behavior. That's just one example. We could probably get into more um, if we want to talk about more. Um, but I just, I want to make sure we hear other questions. That's, that's kind of where my brain goes initially with that question. Well, Donnie, thank you. Spasiba, Bolshoi, Spasiba for that great question. Um, sorry for lapsing into Russian. Donnie is a wonderful uh, Russianist, among other things. Um, and that's a, that's a terrific answer, uh, Janae. There's a, there's a lot to be said about this. Um, and in fact, we have another question that build or a comment from uh, Kate Borowski at Southwest Minnesota State. And she wants to share this thought. This adds another tool to the toolbox to help faculty help students engage with content. Beyond engagement is horizontal reading. Reading multiple sources, part of the dive. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I think that... Um... That lateral reading, it happens at different speeds. So I'm just saying, I, I see there's a few other questions in the chat too, but Donnie as, a, as an add-on, so that sounds a bit like speed reading. Mm -hmm. and, and in some cases it might be, right? It might be that you're kind of looking across, trying to quickly assess. And in other cases, right, once you've maybe winnowed down, okay, these are the multiple sources I need to read or think across or imagine in conversation with each other. Um, that's when we start to do that deeper dive, right? And that's when we might use some other um, information literacy techniques, um, like trying to identify the fuller context for this particular reading, sort of reading beyond the text itself to do a little bit of that research on where does the text come from? Who wrote this? Um, 
you know, I'll cite my Caulfield's work again. He recommends using, you know, even Wikipedia to look up things about mm -hmm. the source that the articles publish in, etc. You know, these kinds of techniques, they're, they're uniquely um, possible to do on screen. You could probably do these things in a library. In fact, I know you can. Uh, it will just take you a lot longer and be a lot less accessible um, from where you are. So to really draw attention to the mobility, the portability, the flexibility of some of these kinds of skills, it just feels like a real missed opportunity when we get into that kind of screed about, you know, screens are making us stupid or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, has been claimed for over a decade, which is always a claim that just, again, it kind of grates at me because it makes an assumption about media itself dictating certain kinds of behaviors, which mm -hmm. is not going to be the case if we're mindful. Quite true. Quite true. That's a, that's a wonderful response. Uh, Kate, good to see you. And, and thank you for that thoughtful comment. And uh, friends, if you're, if you're just joining us now, uh, we have uh, Dr. Janae Cohn, who is still talking to us about her wonderful new book. Uh, and we have a whole bunch of questions. One came in from someone who couldn't make it today. And this was from the splendid Michael Johnson. Uh, he wanted to ask for you to speak to the question of accessibility. So not, not financial accessibility, but, but accessibility for people with different forms of disability. Uh, and how does that play out in digital reading now? Yeah, thanks for that question. I think there's a number of ways in which digital reading um, has really transformed and opened up potential for reading to be more accessible um, for people for whom reading is not a visual medium. Um, you know, something that kind of blew my mind in researching this book is that our current definition of literacy, of print-based literacy, as... Um, really being focused on sort of the visual and ocular capacity is a super new definition. And by new <laughs> context of history, it's like a couple centuries old. But in the context of like history, millennia that we've lived through, that's like a blip in the literacy radar. Um, that really literacy for, for just hundreds of thousands of years was about oral practice, was about memorization. Um, I mean, there's the famous, probably many of you are familiar with, with Socrates' old concern about writing, um, that writing would inherently like destroy our memories because it mm -hmm. would degrade our abilities to speak with each other. And that's sort of proven to be true, right? Um, and so that's all to say that what digital reading really provides us is this ability to actually open up the potential to think about reading is happening in multiple modalities at once, um, which is really great for accessibility, right? So if you are working with um, a reader, if you're a reader herself, who wants to or benefit from hearing text rather than seeing it, pretty much every device has an instant accessibility feature of a uh, text-to-speech tool. Mm -hmm. You can have anything narrated to you that is written in text. That's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And you could toggle between you know, audio and visual mediums easily, which is great for um, readers who might need that kind of accommodation. Um, I think the other component of digital reading that's really powerful is for things like illustrations too. Again, if you're reading a printed book with a picture, an illustration, a graphic, an image in it, that's gonna, that's completely inaccessible to you. I, I, there's braille, of course, which can be a way to access those images. But on screen, you have this capacity to, again, have alt text descriptions, um, screen readers that can kind of help navigate through some of those pieces that are inherently an important part of a reading experience, um, but that we might not really think about. So kind of my, my first shot at that accessibility question, but that's all to say, oh, I will say one more thing about it, which is that reading on screen is also great for um, accessibility in terms of color contrast, um, mm -hmm. in terms of thinking about text size and spacing. You know, so digital text is customizable, which can, again, really open up the accessibility um, for people who might not necessarily uh, benefit from white on black, right, who might need or who might need those colors inverted or something. There's a lot of great research out there on digital readability and the ways that can really improve uh, reading speed, comprehension, efficacy, all from accessibility-based lens. Well, that's a that's a fantastic answer, a very optimistic answer, uh, and I, I love the way that you shifted from text only, um, not just to images, but to sound. Uh, and in the chat, we've had questions about people dictating as well as listening. Uh, it makes me think not only of the podcast second wave we're enjoying right now, but also uh, audiobooks and and how popular they are. 
Um, I mean, it really may be that we shouldn't think about reading as a silent um, endeavor uh, any longer. We have uh, uh, more questions coming in. I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to ask. Uh, and one builds on the question, I think, of accessibility to an extent. Uh, this is from Janet at British Columbia. Hello. Are physical effects like eye strain, neck back issues, decreased cortisol, a digital reading different from paper reading? I'm going I'm to keep, I'm going to flash that on the screen again because that's, that's a really rich question. I'll make sure everyone can see it again. Uh, the physical effects of digital reading, how are they different from paper based? Yeah, thanks, Janet. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think that what you've listed in the question. Eye strain, neck strain, back strain. Yeah, those are all huge concerns with reading on a screen. I'm sure all of us who've had a lot more time on screens in the last 17 months than maybe we ever have before have, have felt these impacts firsthand. So I recognize that a screen um, for certain kinds of bodies, maybe for all bodies, is not always going to work all the time. Um, Reading from a paperback book may also have effects, negative effects on our bodies. You know, for mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of reading on an airplane and trying to like hunch your body into the tiny seat. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I've gotten like the worst neck and back aches from trying to read in tiny spaces. Like, oh, yep. Oh, <laughs> exactly. Yes, good demo. Um, so I think the point is, I think mindfulness really here is 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 key. Um, and thinking about kind of hacks and ways we can customize our experiences can really help with some of those embodied limitations um you know so right off the top of my head with screens there are lots of applications you can download to reduce the blue light glare mm -hmm. on your screen so it's the, the blue light um from your from your screens that kind of causes that eye strain so there's red light filters and just different kinds of filters you can use to adjust the visual um appearance of screens that can help um there's ergonomics to kind of help lift up monitors to put them at eye level. Mm -hmm. um, phones are trickier because that's a really good way to kind of hunch and have your neck forever in yeah. a crick. Um, but yeah, you're right. You're <laughs> taking breaks. Yeah, I, I think that we just have to acknowledge that that all technologies are going to have sort of embodied constraints and concerns with them, um, and that the more we can kind of encourage um, opportunities to recognize where we can where we can hack or we can find ways to make the, it more comfortable for our own bodies maybe accepting those audio options as, as a as an excellent alternative because if you're listening you can you know read while taking a walk for example or read while lying on your back with your eyes closed um, these might all be ways to just just accept these sorts of alternatives well, that's a really good point I, I i mean reading anything humans do can uh, really hurt us and injure us. We're very good at that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> we and, are. Janet, by the way, thank you for making this uh, an international uh, discussion. Always good to see Canada represented, especially uh, the West Coast, uh, which is wonderful. Um, if, you're, if you're new to the forum, uh, you've just seen a whole series of questions there in the Q&A box. If you'd like to join us on stage, uh, you see that uh, Janae and I are both pretty friendly. Uh, so just press the raise hand button if you'd like to uh, continue to make uh, our reading an oral matter. Uh, we have a great question from the uh, author, consultant, and all-around uh, wonderful person, Stephen Ehrman, who asks us to think about digital writing. What, how do you analyze digital writing? How does that relate to digital reading? Uh, and he specifies writing that better achieves its purpose through digital tools and media. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. I'm glad that question got, got moved here. I saw it was in the chat. and Anyway, I'm glad it made its way um, into the Q&A. So I think there's a really strong and clear relationship between digital reading and writing because reading is a way of thinking, processing other people's thoughts, and of course writing is thinking too. Um, so I do think that when it comes to certain kinds of writing projects and practices, uh, yes, um, I've thought a lot about how um, tools for digital writing um, might be well aligned with where we encounter tools for digital reading as well. So I guess as a, a con I'll use a research example again, because I think that's such a, a rich example for kind of illustrating this connection that so much of research-based writing um, is building out and finding connections um, between lots of different voices and people. And we've seen a lot of academics really play around with the form of the scholarly research monograph and digital spaces to do some really interesting things that highlight 
and amplify those voices that they might be encountering across the web. That might be through using sort of hypertext and multimodality, bringing in audio samples of people talking um, mm -hmm. by way of illustrating the research experience. Um, that might be bringing in certain kinds of images or infographics that show connections between different scholarly voices. So these are all kind of examples, I think, of digital writing production um, that branch really well from the, re the digital reading process of encountering webs of voices and ideas and customizing how those um, sort of appear or are communicated and understood. Uh, Stephen, thank you for the great question. And uh, what a wonderful answer, very pro-web question, uh, which I really appreciate. Um, we, uh, the chat box, by the way, is, is just blowing up. People are sharing thoughts and ideas like mad, which is great. Uh, everybody yeah. else, please feel free to hit the Q&A box. Um, and those of you who are tweeting, uh, like uh, the awesome Roxanne and the equally splendid Joe, just keep tweeting out. Uh, great to uh, great to hear all this. Speaking of which, on the, uh, on Twitter, I, I tweeted out my rumination about the audio and uh, silent reading, and someone just threw in, over the last 18 months, I've listened to many more books than I have read. That is new. So it may be that the pandemic has become uh, an age of oral textuality. Uh, we also have a, a really practical question from Michelle. And the quick answer to Michelle is just to read this new book. But I'll let her ask this anyway. Uh, the question is, are there annotation practices that we typically focus toward print text that are available for digital reading? And are some more effective than others? Seriously, Michelle, it's a really good question. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Michelle. Um, yeah, I'll give a brief answer, but I, I will I will also echo Brian's plug for the book um, because the sort of part two of the book really focuses on like concrete class activities. And there are a number of activities um, that are related to annotation in particular. So you might just find it helpful to see like, here's how you could do this step-by-step -step in your class. Um, but I will say that, uh, there's a couple different kinds of annotation practices that I think are especially well suited um, for the screen. Um, again, one is that social piece again. So the benefit of us reading and being online is, hey, we get to interact and see how other people are responding in real time um, to what we're encountering in text, right? So annotation in print is usually just, it's a one-way exchange. You're just responding to the author. Um, but online, you can see a whole community of people responding to that author at the same time. So I think that's a real, a really beneficial, you know, kind of component. And, you know, Brian mentioned Hypothesis, uh, Perusal is another very popular example of this kind of tool that sort of accomplishes this sort of real-time social work. Um, I'll also throw another kind of newer player in the game, Power Notes, I think is doing this really well uh, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what what's sort of different, I think, about Power Notes as an annotation practice that I think what it reinforces a little different is not only is it social, but another annotation practice just to be thinking about is the practice of being able to kind of clip and move text around, right? So when you're annotating a book in the margins, the text is static, right? You can't manipulate where that where one paragraph goes or another. Um, but online, theoretically, what you could do is careful to you know avoid plagiarism, talk to your students about this, but you can like screenshot portions of the text, you can copy and paste portions, you can move them into your notes and annotate them in different configurations, you can see where different arguments might be laying in different kinds of ways. Um, and I mentioned Power Notes because they have kind of this cool tool where you can highlight part of the text and aggregates into like what they call an outline view. And you can move things around the outline once you've clipped different things from the web. Um, it's pretty neat. So you could do that in a Word document too. <laughs> of course, like you could just copy and paste stuff and move it there or a Google mm -hmm. Doc. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a lot of different ways you can kind of emulate that sort of thinking. But you know, I hope that answers that question fully. There's a lot of different ways you could take that. Michelle, it's a great question. And, and by the way, you mentioned Power Notes. We have uh, up to four members of the Power Notes team. Who, uh, who, who might be here today. I haven't checked yet, but uh, who have been in different sessions. So uh, thank you. Okay. Tonight. Yeah. And, awesome. And, and Michelle, thank you again. And, and good luck with this. Um, we have uh, another question coming in from uh, Gerald Petrozella, uh, Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. And he asks, building on the last, do you think it's possible for us to expand reading to include more than words, image reading, etc.? And how big a challenge do you think pose to current academia? So we, we, we've addressed this to an extent, but I do want to focus on that last part. How do we encompass this in academia? Since, as you point out in the first few chapters of your book, so much of our knowledge and model of knowledge is focused on the, uh, on, on the printed text. Yes, uh, it is a big challenge, <laughs> I think, to be expansive and inclusive in our definitions of reading. And, and this has been, I think, um, I owe this kind of thinking about 
imagining literacy as um, being expansive and beyond alphabetic text to generations of literacy scholars before me. You know, multimodal mm -hmm. literacy is a huge field. Um, that's my, what really my training is in. So um, it's a question near and dear to my heart. Um, so I guess you know the answer to the first part of your question is to underscore. Yes, I think we do need to be more expansive and generous and inclusive in our understanding of reading, if for no other reason than to avoid um, some of the, I would say, frankly, um, inadvertently ableist assumptions that go with the kinds of skills that it means to read, specifically by focusing so much on visual capacity, we're excluding, again, a number of people for whom access to visual information is, is just simply not an option. Yeah. Um, so I think that we, we, we have an imperative from a kind of inclusion perspective to be mindful and cognizant um, of the multimodal capacities for reading in general. I mean, academia kind of depends on who you're talking about, right? In terms of it, like this willingness to kind of accept um, more inclusive definitions of reading. And I, I think where it can start is in the classroom and being prepared to practice universal design for learning um, ideology. Um, you know, for those who aren't familiar, universal design for learning really advocates for instructors adding multiple ways of representing, engaging, and um, helping students participate in their class experience. And so reading is a great example, where if you kind of imagined ways that you could read um, that aren't just with text, but you could, again, just make it just even as simple as saying, hey, students, did you know you can listen to this? Mm. It's as simple as that. Mm. A lot of students will be surprised. Wow, really, I can listen mm -hmm. to my reading? And that counts? I, I think we need to kind of get rid of language like, I had a lot of people ask me early when I was writing this book, like, well, is listening to my podcast reading, does that count as a book? Yeah, mm -hmm. of course it does, because you can yeah. read the podcast too. You can read a transcript. Um, <laughs> these are, are all kind of ideas that relate to, and I think it comes back to Tom's question from the start here about this is information exchange and accessing other modes of interiority and subjectivity. And I just see no harm in trying to get more inclusive and generous in our understanding. But Sometimes yeah. academia is not inclusive and generous <laughs> as much as we'd like it to be. So that, that culture change, I think, can just happen with, with all of you who are, are here. The more we can encourage it and share, the better. Agreed. Agreed. And if I could put in a plug for the past, a couple of years ago, we hosted the uh, truly wonderful writer, Kathleen Fitzpatrick, uh, who, used to, um, who has a, one of her many books is called Generous Thinking. And it's about rethinking uh, higher education in that way. Um, in, in the chat, we've had a few different comments about people who, uh, scholars who read images first, both in uh, poli sci and the sciences, which is very interesting. Um, and, but we have more questions coming in. And again, if anyone wants to join us on stage, uh, we'll be nice, I promise this time. Uh, so just hit the raised hand button. Now, we have two very practical questions, uh, very material questions. One has to do with eye tracking. Uh, Brent uh, Auerheimer, I believe, mentions that there's much data from eye tracking for reading on paper and online and how those are different. How does eye tracking relate to your work? Yeah, thanks, Brent, and hello from the Cal State system. <laughs> Brent and I are, are colleagues in the CSUs, so it's nice to see a Great. Cal State colleague here. Um, so yes, there's overlaps, I think, with eye tracking research in terms of understanding reading behaviors on screen. So um, I didn't have a chance to click your link, but it looks like that's from the sort of the Nielsen group, which does a lot of great I'll bring it back up again. user experience research. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a Nielsen group. I might even cite this one in my uh, in my book. I can't remember. <laughs> I cite a lot of things. I don't have the book next to me right now. That's what the book is um, for. Socrates is right. You don't have to remember it. Exactly. Just refer to what I wrote down many yep. uh, moons ago. Yeah. Um, so I'll just say that um, eye tracking research can kind of help us understand uh, patterns and behaviors that may give us a sense of um, how design and interface might be impacting behavior. Um, so a lot of eye tracking research um, has sort of demonstrated that on websites, there's certain kinds of patterns um, that people always follow. Um, the most common one that folks refer to is the F-shaped pattern, where you sort of look at the headline, and you look a little at the sub headline below, and everything else kind of gets skimmed below that. Um, that is a common pattern, but there's been a lot of research that has sort of debunked that everyone is reading a website in an F-shaped pattern. Um, I've heard some behaviors referred to as a layer cake pattern, where people might be kind of scanning and skipping text by text. Um, or I've also seen um, like a U-shaped pattern, where you kind of read a lot at the front and then read a lot at the end and nothing in the middle. Um, mm -hmm. And the point is, eye tracking can give us some senses of how certain genres get navigated. And I think the important conclusion for me there is that people's engagements and ways they move their eyes 
is not going to be universally applicable across all websites. That it's going to depend largely on what people are on that website for, um, mm -hmm. what their reasoning is, um, and what their previous encounters with that genre might be. So that F-shape formation comes up a lot because we're used to reading, for example, things like news websites where it's like a very linear headline, text body, et cetera, kind of format. Um, but again, not all websites are designed that way. So it's interesting, I think, just to understand the interaction be between human behavior across these sites, uh, but also, again, how that aligns with motivational purposes and um, interface design. This is one of the uh, real strengths of your book, by the way, that I, I haven't mentioned yet, is that again and again, you emphasize that instructors need to pay careful attention to students. Uh, to students where they are, to students' habits, to try and find out how and where students read. I mean, in, in the chat earlier, uh, Tracy was asking about this. And I think that's just, I'm really glad to see that. Not all people do this when they, when they uh, write about writing. Um, we, the other practical question uh, comes from uh, John Henry Stites, uh, who is a colleague of mine. Uh, and he asks, when researching deep within a discipline, there are often texts, many historical, available in print only. Do limits on digitization economic or intellectual property restrict the range of digital sources? Yeah, absolutely, they do. Um, thank you for the question, John. It, that's that's a real, um, a, that's a perfect example of a material constraint um, that I think a lot of uh, historians and archivists in particular, librarians, yeah. I'll say are really grappling with. Um, there's been a lot of controversy too over digitization projects, right? So, um, of course, Google Books tried to digitize every book in the world, and um, mm -hmm. that didn't perhaps end <laughs> in the way that they were expecting. Namely, yeah. they didn't digitize every book in the world. Um, and the ways that they were digitizing things were not always responsible um, to the text itself um, or to the pres preservational practices around those books. Um, I, I guess my main advice would be talk to your librarians, right? And because your librarians are awesome. They're superstars. <laughs> and I love librarians. And they're going to know, for example, if there are any particular historical societies or um, archival societies or um, digital preservation groups. There's a lot of nonprofits, digital preservation nonprofits that are working to digitize certain collections. Of course, places like Ikati Trust are, I think, doing really well at starting to create better and more robust, more robust archives of historical texts as well. But I recognize that for things like medieval manuscripts, um, heck, I mean, this is maybe a different field, but you know, Sumerian tablets, if you're studying those, sometimes you just kind of got to see in person because the materiality of that object actually does depend on being able to feel it and touch it and see it. So I also don't want to discount that digitization. It may not be the best way to study certain kinds of texts, depending on what you're trying to analyze or depending what you're trying to do. So there's there's a case to be made for really appreciating the unique material affordance of a text um, that was produced in a pre-digital era and analyzing and understanding it as material object to kind of embody the readerly experience to the extent that you can of someone in that time. Do you think we'll see more of that um, in terms of using more advanced digitization? I mean, thinking, for example, about, uh, I'm thinking some of the happy accidents, like when I look at uh, an archive.org uh, scan and you can see someone's hand just caught off to the side of it. Um, <laughs> right. But, but also, if we could use tools like photogrammetry to be able to give, uh, you know, a three-dimensional sense of a, of a manuscript or a book or a tablet or a journal, um, I mean, that might be a way of, of making the experience a little bit deeper. Absolutely. Well, because it gets at, it kind of simulates the, the material conditions in some capacity. Yeah. I saw in the chat, someone at some point mentioned uh, VR Mm -hmm. in some capacity, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I could imagine some pretty interesting like VR experiences of like going into the archives and mm -hmm. uh, looking at some rare books collections and kind of getting a feel for it that way. Um, mm -hmm. In maybe some universe at some point that might happen. But again, I think it depends on what you're trying to study, what you're trying to do with that text, um, yeah. that, that the touch, the smell, this is a thing people love. People love to smell books, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and in my book, I, I treat that with some amount of affection because I do love a book smell, right? <laughs> like it's if you're a reader, identify that way. Um, that's a that's a that's an emotion that's evoked there. And that's powerful. And yeah. sometimes you do want to evoke that emotion. And other times you may not need to. And it's all it's all good. <laughs> no matter what. We're not it's not like the digitization of text means you have to like don't get rid of all your print books just because you can digitize them. Just accept there might be different ways to appreciate and approach them. Well said. Well said. 
Uh, we have another question coming in from Roxanne Riskin, a delightful person and a great, great friend and supporter of the program. And Roxanne asks about Lexile ranges and how can higher ed digital online reading assignments take that into account, or is that even possible? So I'm, I'm maybe I'm not totally sure what the term Lexile range means. Does that mean um, oh, let me, let me bring lexicon? Let me bring her up on stage. And Roxanne okay. is drafting you right now. You're going to have to come up on stage. Hello. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. I just, I lost you. No, you're right there. We can hear you. Can you hey, hear Roxanne. You? Jeez, give me a second. I kind of lost my screen. There I am. Hi. <laughs> so, hi. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brian. And thank you um, for taking my question. Um, the Lexile score is the difficulty of the text reading. And okay. Yeah. And that's usually seen in K through 12. But it's also in higher ed. It's given scores of the difficulty of the text. Got it. Okay. Thank you. I had a feeling it was about. Yeah. Search that. I put a link in the in the chat about this. Okay. I'll have to check out your link. Um, you know, in all honesty, um, I haven't directly. Oh, I see the Lexile framework for reading 2012. Okay. I'll have to go check that it out, Roxanne. Really, is really. I think maybe that's in your next book. <laughs> There we go. Next project is there's always a next project you can build upon, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that you know, in some ways. So my background's in rhetoric and composition. So when I think about um, kind of difficulty, right, with vocabulary or with word length or with um, sentence structure, you know, a lot of it is very genre and discourse community specific. Um, and so I think a lot of ways that faculty can help students respond to that challenge is by sort of exposure to norms and conventions in the discourse community, you know, making visible what kinds of moves writers are making in those kinds of texts can kind of reduce that barrier to entry. And that would be true, I think, regardless of, of media. And in some ways in digital spaces, it could be easier to, um, to make those moves visible. You could have, you know, create visual patterns or outlines of how a scholarly text is moving in the discipline, for example. In scientific texts, they follow a formula anyway. You know, they follow that IMRAD format, intro methods, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So you could kind of just make those conventions transparent, which might reduce some of that barrier to difficulty. And with challenging vocabulary, for example, again, the ability to easily use, you know, find a dictionary online to define words. You know, I, I saw in the chat a little bit. I apologize, usually I'm, I'm good at keeping up with the chat. We just had a lot of good questions to dig into. Um, but I saw kind of a, someone mentioned they loved reading on their Kindle. You know, a lot of these dedicated e-readers do have, you know, features built in where you can tap a word and look up a definition on the spot. Um, there's accessibility tools called, was one called Kurzweil that maybe some folks oh, yeah. are familiar with. Yeah, that kind of also reduces some of maybe what you're thinking about, Roxanne, with this Lexile um, indicator. So I don't know, just kind of a few quick thoughts off the top of my head. Um, does that kind of answer your question? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it starts to discuss, it starts to dig into uh, what it really means. And I think that when a lot of professors use, I'm going to use an example of text, the STEM fields, highly technical books that college professors mm -hmm. assign. Mm -hmm. So bringing in that um, into online reading with um, research papers and journals and articles and things like that, if that reading level is really taxing to the students, how much can we load, cognitively load students with that type of information before more anxiety, more stress, and they're just turned off. I mean, the attention focus is just not there, no matter how many mindful practices you're doing. I'm a mindfulness <laughs> educator as well, but and a learning designer, but we have to really dig deep into what faculty are doing in that space and how mm -hmm. much is, how much stress are we should we put in the mixed modality and the universal learning design? Sure, that's fine. But how many professors are really doing that? How are we measuring that? That's mm. just some of my thoughts. And I'm always yeah. out there thinking out on the fringe and on the perimeter of what is in the best interest for the students to maximize their capacities for learning experiences and, and how we design these. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. Absolutely. Thank you, Roxanne. That's fantastic. Thank Always good to see you. Thank you. You too. Uh, we have a couple of notes in the uh, in the chat about this. Uh, David Furlow mentions Lexile scores and some of the uh, uh, learning assessments are an example of unrealized potential. 
Um, educators could use this to differentiate students and become more agile, providing students with appropriate challenges. Uh, I mentioned a bit more sarcastically, um, but realistically, there have been mm -hmm. Lexile studies of politicians' speeches, which are very depressing because they usually find people speaking at a fifth grade level. Um, we are uh, almost at the very end of the session, um, and, and since there are no other questions outstanding, I'm going to seize the moderator's privilege and ask a question uh, of my own. Uh, what do you think happens to uh, digital reading, say, about 10 years from now? I mean, thinking about the impact of everything we've discussed, about VR, about audio, about the pandemic, about accessibility, um, where, what does it look like to read an e-text in, say, 2030? Hmm. I think it'll continue to take on really diverse forms. Um, I think by 2030, we'll have lots of options and choices about how to engage with text. And I think it's going to become increasingly handheld, um, right? I think the fact that we are ubiquitously, I think it's safe to say we're ubiquitously on mobile um, as, as a technology. And so I do think that the future of kind of reading is going to be um, in imagining how to optimize um, kind of engagement interaction with text through mobile, that by 2030, it's not going to seem so weird anymore <laughs> to uh, be reading a long piece or a book on a phone. It already isn't that weird, but I think it's really going to be widely accepted by 2030, and that perhaps we'll have um, increased optimization to customize um, on mobile in particular, it'll be even easier to kind of find and see connections between text and image and audio. That there'll be a lot more integration um, between all these media, which I think will make really visible these kinds mm. of expanded uh, opportunities and options. I've been struck by the amount of reading uh, available in computer games right now. Um, that not not attached to computer games like strategy guides, but just that within a lot of computer games, there are slabs of, of reading to be done, which we don't often think about. Uh, I, I do want to grab something from the chat here and lift it out. Uh, this is from uh, Joe Murphy, who mentions that for him, he finds the human voice uh, really returns his attention in a way that nothing else does. And I want to grab that to say that's a good insight, but also to say that I want to thank you, Janae, for sharing your voice with us for this hour. Um, you, have, you have taught us so much and shared so much, just so accessibly. I just want to thank you very, very much. Well, what's, oh, thank you. What's the, what's the best way to keep up with you and your work? <laughs> um, you can keep up with me in a few different ways. Um, I'm pretty active on Twitter. So that's kind of where I'm kind of publicly microblogging. I'll put my handle in the chat there um, one more time. Um, I keep an up website pretty up to date. I haven't blogged there mm -hmm. in too long. It's just been a it's been a year, y'all. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you felt that. So uh, mm -hmm. you can kind of hop on my website, check that out that that out too. Um, those are probably the two best ways to find me from okay. here. Um, but I hope to stay in touch with all of you. And LinkedIn, of course, is a good um, way to find me as well. Oh, Thanks great. for joining, everyone. Well, thank you, thank you all. And uh, but don't go away, friends, yet, uh, because I need to tell you about what's happening next. Um, in the future transform. And let me thank you all for this wonderful, wonderful range of questions. Uh, looking ahead, uh, after talking about digital reading today, we'll be looking at improving equity uh, for black students, looking at the educated underclass next week, discussing academic entity mergers, open access scholarship, and rethinking teaching. If you'd like to talk about all these issues, uh, if you'd like to add your voice, if I can drive that point home further or share your images, just use the hashtag FTTE, especially on Twitter, or tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or at Chindig Events. We'd be glad to hear from you. If you'd like to dive into our previous sessions and where this recording will be, hopefully in a few hours, uh, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. We've had all kinds of discussions about the digital world and what it means for learning. Uh, thank you all again for your, the wonderful gift of your attention, your terrific thoughts, your sense of humor, and above all, it's just a pleasure to think with all of you. Um, until next time, take care, be safe, and we'll see you online. Bye-bye. <laughs>